Good afternoon, everyone. This is Jean Beale, the Senior Vice President for Programs and Services at Catholic Charities USA, and I want to welcome you to this year's annual survey webinar. Um, we are going to start in with a prayer, but before I do that, I just want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded. The phone lines and computer speakers are being muted, so you can't say anything, but if you want to submit questions throughout the presentation, do that in the question box, and those questions will be answered at the end. And if we aren't able to address all the questions, you'll receive an email response. Thank you for coming because it's so important for us to have your participation in this survey. We really are aiming at 100% participation this year. When I do uh, work with boards around the, the country or with uh, agency staff, I always include annual survey data. So it's really important from my perspective, but even more so for our policy perspectives to be able to say what you all are doing in all of the places around the country. So again, thank you so much for participating in this webinar and even more for participating in the survey. So today we're going to have four presenters, besides three presenters besides me, Carrie Glova, Ashley, and Sharon Byrne from Clinic. And now we can do the prayer. So let's just remember we're always in God's presence. We ask your blessings on us, O oh God. In our discouragement and fatigue, grant us laughter and support. In our weakness, grant us acceptance. In our questioning, grant that we may stand in truth. In our leadership, grant us wisdom. We know that a different world cannot be built by indifferent people. And so we ask that there be no apathy in our lives, no lukewarmness or mediocrity, only your love and grace. For all things now and still to be, we give you thanks. Amen. And now, Carrie. Great. Thanks, Jean, so much. Hi, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on what time zone that you're joining us from. Uh, this is Carrie Glova, Director of Research and Evaluation here at CCUSA. Just want to welcome you guys again. Uh, so we're going to start just with a quick overview of our agenda today. We have lots of great things in store. We had our welcome and our prayer from Jean Beale. Uh, Ashley's going to take over shortly and walk us through the annual survey purpose. So for some of you, it might be your first annual survey, and for some of you, it might be your fifth or tenth or fifteenth. Um, but we always like to reiterate really what the purpose of this project is and what are uh, some of the major uses of the data that we collect, uh, including the uses that are available to our member agencies, everyone here that's joining us. Uh, we'll go through another high-level overview of the instrument. So not question by question, but looking at the different sections so you have a better understanding of the types of data that we collect and that you can anticipate to prepare when you're doing your submission. We will transfer it over to Sharon Burns, who is the new Measurement uh, Learning and Evaluation Manager uh, at CLINIC, the Catholic Legal Immigration Network. And Sharon is actually joining CLINIC from uh, Catholic Charities in Evansville, so we're excited to welcome her and continue working with her in this capacity. She will overview the CLINIC portion of the survey regarding immigration legal services. So once we go through that, we will dive into some of the instructions um, to how to access the survey, what are the uh, timelines regarding the submission, and a couple of uh, technical details and tools that will really help you get started um, and on your way into the submission. One of which is a tool called the Respondent Aggregation Tool. So it's a really crafty thing that we've developed uh, based on some of the feedback that we receive that should hopefully help with your kind of data aggregation process. We'll review the CCUSA Members Portal, um, which will be your shop for all of the resources that we review here um, so that you can share with your colleagues or that you can access um, kind of on the web-based server, and we'll talk about that. And then we'll save some time for question and answer. Um, so feel free, as Jean mentioned, to submit questions and those um, in the time that we have left over, those that were really uh, good for the purpose of the group, we'll make sure to try to address. And then anything that we can't address, uh, we'll make sure we follow up by email. So we'll go ahead and get started. 
Uh, Ashley, I'll pass it to you. Perfect. Thank you, Carrie. Um, as mentioned earlier, my name is Ashley Reininger. I'm an analyst on the research and evaluation team here at Catholic Charities USA. Um, and I hope everyone is as excited to be here today as we are. So before we get started and really dive into the good stuff, the 2019 annual survey, um, we wanted to take a moment and just give a little bit of background on the survey, including its purpose and how we use the data that we collect. Uh, so very simply stated, the purpose of the annual survey is really to quantify the size, scope, and impact of the collective Catholic Charities ministry. Um, Carrie and I often hear the question, so what do you do with the annual survey data? And our favorite answer is really just to say, well, everything. Um, but to give a little bit more context, we did want to provide some tangible examples for you. Um, so most commonly, annual survey data is used internally by our strategic priority and other program area leads to really help them understand essentially the universe of agencies that are operating kind of in their respective program areas. Um, it helps provide insight on where our activity and impact is greatest as a network and where we may need to focus kind of additional support or resources. Uh, so for anybody who's active in either a community of practice or any of the sections we have here at CCUSA, uh, you may be familiar that we often use annual survey data as kind of a part of those uh, communities of practice or sections to really inform the activities and planning for those groups and determine where to focus and allocate resources moving forward. Um, so if annual survey data tells us, for example, that we have a significant number of agencies providing a specific service and we aren't currently really offering much at the national level to support those efforts, uh, COPs or sections may use that information to strategically brainstorm how to proceed. Uh, annual survey data is also used when planning different trainings or developing different cohorts. Again, based on which agencies are offering specific services or who may be well equipped to uh, kind of start participating in something new, uh, either because of their geographic location or because of the services already existing in their portfolio. We also uh, sometimes do targeted outreach, especially in the event of certain current events. Um, with this, definitely thinking about anything immigration related or responding to any natural disasters that may have occurred. Um, and then this is probably the most obvious, but we definitely use annual survey data externally to communicate our work to not only the general public, but also to donors, to national funders, potential partners, and especially to support our presence on Capitol Hill. Uh, so it's important to note that for really all of these functions, but especially for our social policy staff, the more detail and data that we can provide about the services that we're offering and the impact we have, the more convincing our appeals generally are. And so with regard to policy uh, specifically, these data elements allow them to have specific asks when they go into congressional meetings. Um, so instead of simply just describing kind of the services we provide and where, having the ability to really quantify uh, the scope and the impact and communicate how vital those services really are to a community helps add a lot of weight and really credibility. Uh, and then I would say perhaps most importantly, annual survey data is utilized by you all. So, you know, definitely highly utilized by the member agencies. And we recognize that you all definitely take a lot of time to report on these metrics each year. And we understand that can be a time consuming process for some. Uh, so in return, we really want to make sure that your participation is of maximum value. So to facilitate this, uh, we do a number of things. We conduct an additional webinar in the summer. Um, we'll report the aggregated survey results. We also have a number of interactive visualizations um, based on our analyses that are available via the members portal. And we will review some of those momentarily. Um, and then last, we frequently receive data requests from the network interested in different activities such as benchmarking, collaborating, or really just learning more, uh, more and about the work of their peers. Um, so when CCUSA does strategic planning with an agency, as Jean had mentioned at the beginning, annual survey data is definitely used during those sessions uh, to communicate to boards and management staff the importance of their contributions to the national ministry, but also, again, the potential for expanding. And then we often hear from agencies when they're launching a new program, wanting to know which other agencies operate something similar so they have someone to reach out to as either like a founding board or providing thought leadership, sharing lessons learned, things of that nature. Um, so just definitely keep in mind with all of that said uh, that 
uh, CCUSA and the entire network really do rely on this data. So as I mentioned on the last slide, uh, we have a number of resources available via the members portal. That does include a few visualizations that are intended to give the ministry access to uh, high-level aggregate information as well as some agency-specific data elements. Um, so here you can see the 2018 member agency profile. Uh, this will allow folks to select an agency denoted by the diocese that they're located in from the drop-down menu on the left. Um, and then they can view metrics related to both operations and key service areas as reported in the most recent annual survey. So you can see at the top, uh, there are you know, clients, employees, things like that. On the right, there are some high-level metrics related really to um, strategic priorities or different program areas. And then you can see the largest program areas based on client serve and by the total budget. And then we also have the 2018 agency service inventory. So this kind of approaches it from the opposite lens. Um, anybody who's interested can select a specific service type or service category, and then a respective service element to see all of the agencies, again, denoted by dioceses, um, that reported providing that service in the most recent annual survey. Uh, and Carrie's gonna touch on this again a little later, but definitely keep in mind that we're gonna update both of these resources with 2019 annual survey data as soon as it's uh, collected, cleaned, analyzed, and ready to go. So before we dive into the 2019 survey, uh, we do want to take a moment and review some of the 2018 survey highlights. So our agency response rate in 2019 was 91 percent, which we were very impressed by, um, especially keeping in mind all of the recent changes with administration and the survey and all of that. Um, but like Jean mentioned, we're shooting for 100 percent this year, uh, so each year we strive to kind of bump that up a little bit. Um, we also wanted to highlight that CCUSA uses aggregated financial data to submit to outside entities that conduct uh, basically comparison studies of nonprofits across the country, and this includes the nonprofit times. So in 2018, we ranked third of their 100 largest nonprofits, which was a bump up from, or sorry, in 2019, we ranked third, which was a bump up from our uh, number five ranking in 2018. And then finally, in 2018, we continued our efforts to collect more information on key performance measures. So related to financial assistance, employment self-sufficiency, refugee resettlement, homelessness assistance, and mental health services. And as a side, one of our goals moving forward in 2019, but also past that, um, is to continue emphasizing performance measures. So don't expect those to go anywhere. All right, so the best part, 2019 survey. Um, now that we've had a chance to kind of give a little bit of context and discuss the survey in general, we want to dive into what to expect this year. Um, so just as kind of a brief overview for anybody who may be unfamiliar, the survey has essentially two sections. So we have what we call the core, which is primarily agency level data, and then we also have various program detail sections, which as the name would imply, captures more programmatic um, detail as well as those performance measures we talked about. Um, so this year, uh, the core data elements are fairly consistent to those from last year. There's not really any big changes here to worry about, um, but we will be collecting total unduplicated client count and then a breakdown by race and ethnicity. Um, client served and resources expended, um, including program expenses, volunteers, and employees by primary aim. An inventory of program service elements provided at the agency level. Uh, agency finances, um, information on staffing, service sites, and agency accreditation, and then primary contact information for strategic priorities and other program areas. Um, we did move some of our volunteer-related questions out of the core and into a different section, uh, so we'll touch on that later. We reincorporated a question capturing the number of service sites, which is why we have this fancy yellow highlight. Um, we added an open-ended question regarding which accreditations your agency holds. And then just a note on that last one, um, that's an existing element, the primary contact information for strategic priorities and other program areas. But we did add a few program areas to that list, so just keep an eye out for that. And then I mentioned the primary aim categories in the previous slide, so I did want to briefly review them just in case you're not familiar. Um, there are 14 of them. 
uh, cultivate children's emotional and intellectual development, develop and promote Catholic identity and strategic engagement with parishes, facilitate recovery and or reduce harm from addiction and serious mental illness, improve quality of life for individuals with physical and neurodevelopmental disabilities, increase access to health care and improve physical and mental well-being, increase access to nutritious food, increase access to stable, affordable housing, increase income and financial self-sufficiency, meet basic needs and close emergency financial gaps, uh, prevent or end homelessness or reduce harm for people experiencing homelessness, promote strong family functioning, recovery from naturally man-made disasters, welcome and integrate immigrants, refugees, and asylees, and then we have an other category as well in case uh, the program or service you're operating doesn't neatly fit into one of those categories. Um, if you're familiar with the survey from last year, these primary aim categories are unchanged from 2018. And just to note that when you're determining which primary aim most accurately defines a program or service, um, try to consider how you would describe the end goal of that program or service and ultimately what you're trying to achieve. Um, and then, of course, if you're still having trouble really meshing it in there, there is an other to capture that. All right, so as mentioned, the second section of the annual survey includes the program detail sections. And these sections are really focused on uh, collecting information on outputs and outcomes. So in addition to quantifying the services we provide, um, we also want to make sure we're capturing the quality of those services and the extent to which our services are making a difference. So if we look at this graphic here on the bottom, uh, the pieces in red are definitely very important, but we also want to make sure that we're capturing as much information in kind of the teal and dark blue as we can as well. Uh, we did make some minor revisions to a few program detail sections, but primarily with the intention of clarifying ambiguity or just revi uh, refining the data that we're collecting. So structurally, don't expect any major changes or surprises. Um, and then I'm sure you noticed the yellow highlight again. So we do have a couple new sections as well. Um, we added this year uh, a program detail on children, youth, and family services. So this includes elements on pregnancy and parenting services, adoption services, and then foster care or uh, transition age youth services. We added a program detail on parish social ministries. So this captures more detailed information on the ways in which agencies engage and partner with local parishes. And then we added a volunteer management and long-term service. So this includes those elements on volunteers and volunteer hours that were previously in the core section. It also includes some information on volunteer demographics, and then any long-term service programs your agency participates with, so things like AmeriCorps or Senior Corps. And then I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Carrie. Um, so she's gonna give a little bit of a demonstration of how to transition from our program detail section to the clinic survey. Thanks, Ashley. So uh, some of you may recall in 2018, Clinic and CCUSA decided to move forward with a joint data collection uh, partnership Previously, Immigration Legal Services Program submitted separate surveys uh, for CCUSA and for clinics. So even if you were a member of both of our networks, um, you essentially did a separate survey. Uh, we worked together last year to pull off the first iteration of the joint survey, and it was very successful. Um, CCUSA particularly uh, collected or was able to access a much richer wealth of information on our agencies. Um, and I do think it helps uh, boost up the participation rate on the clinic side. Um, so now join affiliates between CCUSA and clinic and now complete just one survey and then the results uh, will be shared between the organizations. As Ashley mentioned, there is a section of our survey, the program detail, uh, and that's how you actually access the clinic instrument. Um, so when you select immigration legal services in the CCUSA program detail, it will redirect you actually to a new page um, that takes you to that clinic portion. So I'm gonna go ahead and demo that very briefly. Uh, I know some of you are visual learners as myself. So let's see, here we have uh, a preview link of the program detail survey. I'm gonna go ahead and click ignore validation so I don't actually have to enter any information. Uh, you'll uh, select your diocese, you'll submit your um, kind of personal information as the respondent, you'll answer some questions about where the report goes, um, and then you'll see this item, the major item, 
for which program areas do you want to provide additional program detail? You'll select all that apply. So for many agencies, you may choose several of these. For some, you'll choose fewer. Um, but if you are uh, participating in immigration legal services, that will be one of the ones you select, and you'll hit next. Uh, what that does is take you to a new landing page that just lets you know that you'll be redirected to the clinic portion of that survey. And we are going to then click next again. And then the page will come up to this much prettier uh, survey page, the landing page for the affiliate survey of uh, the Catholic Legal Immigration Network. So that's just to demonstrate kind of the path it will take um, to do that clinic portion. So I'll go ahead and pass it off to Sharon Burns over at clinic um, to talk more about this, the clinic portion of the survey and how you can access that. Sharon, um, are you logged in? Yes, I am. Thank you. Um, I want to thank everybody, especially the team at CCUSA, who uh, I've been with Clinic about a month, and they have been very gracious in helping uh, get this started and helping me bring me along to understand how this is done. So I ask for your patience, but I'm glad to also take any of your questions later and uh, or answer them by email or however you want to communicate uh, to make sure that we get the best responses possible. Um, the first, um, I'm going to go back to what Ashley and Carrie shared. Uh, we collect data for the almost the exact same reasons that they do. Uh, we want to know who you are, what you're doing, um, some information about your uh, uh, what you need uh, for us to do to help you do your job better. And then lastly, we'll go over in a few minutes, we are going to ask a few client questions, questions about your clients. Uh, who are immigration legal services clients. The last thing I want to say before we go into a couple things is um, of the details is that Catholic, I mean clinic, uh, you can tell I'm still mentally Catholic charities jumping, uh, Catholic Legal Immigration Network is offering an incentive uh, to complete the survey to all of our affiliates, both the Catholic Charities Network members and others, uh, and you will be given in your response to the survey completion detail, more details about that. Um, in a week or so, because I'm brand new, I've been here about a month, um, we will also release to all of the point of contacts for our affiliates uh, a high-level uh, executive summary of the results from last year's survey, because we didn't do a webinar like CCUSA, and, and maybe we'll follow suit and do that. Um, but you will get a little bit of the results from last year as well, um, just for your own information. Um, the first slide here is uh, very critical. If you, in a minute, we'll talk about the data you need. But if you need to stop the survey and um, go check data or come back later because of time constraints, you'll be able to do that. On the survey, there's an option uh, to save and continue later. If you hit that, uh, it, the system will ask for your email and to verify your email. And then the system will send you a link that's specifically yours to come back and pick up where you left off. So that's very critical. So don't feel like you have to, even though it's a 30 to 45 minute survey uh, part, don't feel like you need to do it all in one setting if you need to go get information or, or to uh, take a break to do something else. I'll go ahead and ask for the next slide then. Um, the clinic affiliate survey, just like the Catholic Charities USA survey, I believe, is talking about data from January 1 of 19 to December 31st of 19. If you are on a fiscal year and that's the only way you have your data, uh, please let me know and we'll make some kind of accommodation so that your data doesn't get confused with calendar year 19 data if it overlaps two calendar years because you only have it by fiscal year. The data does ask a lot, I mean the survey does ask a lot about numbers. It would be helpful if you maybe pull some of your summaries uh, from your case management software. I think most of you have case management software, and that will help you um, fill out our part of the survey. This is a good prep anyway uh, for your DOJ recognition renewal, which happens every couple of years, because they ask you the data as well. So for you to prepare it for us and give it to us and then keep that and have it ready for your DOJ renewal would be helpful for you as well. Um, some of the areas 
will repopulate and we'll show you those in a, in a few seconds. Um, next slide then. Oh, the last item, I'm sorry, is the number of applications, this is my next point, versus number of people impacted. In one, in one slide or in one question, it asks you about the number of applications that you fill out uh, and then it asks about the number of people impacted. The number of people impacted should be greater than the number of applications you've completed for your client. And that's noted in the survey. Uh, when we talk about the number of people who are impacted, we're talking about the petitioner, the beneficiaries, and their derivatives. So that's how you should do that count. Uh, and I think the words that we use in the survey are number of individuals, uh, number of cases, uh, applications completed and filed, and the number of people who are legally impacted by those applications. So petitioner, benefits, beneficiaries, and derivatives. Next slide. So there are two questions about survey uh, services, and the first one is about the case types that you're filing um, in general, which some of them will just be documentation and application filing. And one of these, and some of them will be immigration court work, which is one of the options. So you're asked about whether you do these cases, and it's a checkbox. And then your another question that follows is, how much immigration court work do you do, and what types? So the details on the immigration court work will be in a follow-up question. And you will then be able to, to share about the types of immigration court work. In both of these slides, and we're only just going to show you this one, but they, the answers that you fill out here pre-populate to a follow-up question which says, oh, how many cases did you file in this area? So if you check, for example, that you uh, filed fee waivers, then a follow-up question will say, how many fee waivers did you file? And that's where your case management software will come in very, very useful. So for both this and the court work, the court uh, immigration court work, it does give the follow-up questions based on how you answer, and then it asks you to tell us how many cases in each of those areas. Now, there may be some cases, and I noticed this with last year's survey results, where normally you do, I'm making this up, but green card renewals. But maybe in 19, you didn't do any. If it's a service, you'll check, yes, I do green card renewals, but in the follow-up question where it says, how many green card renewals did you do in 2019? If it was zero, it was zero. So we're asking, do you do the service? And then if so, how many did you do in 19? Next slide. Um, the immigration court work categories will include the, the ones that are here on the screen, asylum, defense of asylum, uh, bond, detention, LPR cancellation of removal, and non-LPR cancellation, cancellation of removal. Removal, and you will have an opportunity to complete an other, in which case we do, of course, ask for specifics. And again, just as I noted a minute ago, the case types you choose and the services you choose will repopulate in later questions asking for the number in those categories. Um, this, so we're ready for the next slide. Trying to. So basically, uh, we will follow up. This is CCUSA's information, um, but we have the same deadline date. The survey will open immediately, and it will close on May the 1st, 2020. Uh, if by some chance you have trouble getting into it, you just need to email me, and that email is both on the clinic part and on the CCUSA survey. Um, you, we ask that uh, you choose your Make sure you choose your organization correctly, because again, that matches up to the CCUSA survey data, and we link that together later, or we'll link it for them, and vice versa. Um, so that's kind of where we're going with our survey. The only uh, things that didn't come up, um, we are asking a couple of questions, three to be exact, in a new area. We are asking about your clients, the affiliates' clients in immigration legal services. Um, and the reason we're doing that, they're very broad questions, the reason they're doing, we're doing that is, again, to get at some level of impact on the actual client and to help our staff and board and others make decisions uh, based 
on or, or to use that information when we're advocating on the client's behalf as a whole. And those questions relate to these things. We're asking you to estimate, and if you actually have the data, that'd be great, but to estimate what the household income is for your clients that you're filing cases for. And that household income means for all the members who live in that unit, in that apartment or that house. They may not be family, but they're all living together. What's the total household income? And then a follow-up question is how many individuals are living in that household? And then the last personal or question, a client question that we're asking is, in your estimation, what percentage of your clients, and then there's a variety of statements, but one of them is are homeless. Another, and it's defined as we want it defined. Um, another one is um, uh, have minor children in their home, have children in another, minor children in, in living outside the U.S. or in another country. Uh, so some items like that. And the idea, again, is just to get a sense of who the clients are that you're all serving. I think that brings me to the, the end of my, um, my main point. If you have any questions, again, you know, be sure to chat them or um, ask them, and we'll follow up with you. Thank you, Ashley and Carrie and uh, Jean. We, I appreciate your including me. Thanks so much, Sharon. Absolutely. All right. So a lot of great introductory stuff to the survey. Um, now I know you're really excited to learn how you actually get access to it. So we'll start talking about next steps. Uh, so all of the webinar registrants here today will receive uh, immediately concluding this webinar, or perhaps in the next 24 hours, you'll receive two separate emails. Uh, each of the emails will contain a survey link. So Ashley mentioned the survey is made up from the core section and the program detail section. If you register for this webinar, then you'll receive an email with a link for each of those. Um, so you'll have that at your, uh, at your disposal. These survey links are uh, personal survey links, so they're really only meant to be used by the person who that it was generated for. Um, if you don't receive those emails by the end of the business week, uh, end of business on Friday tomorrow, um, please reach out to us. Um, and or if there's some staff that learn about this webinar and perhaps they didn't get on that link list and they will need to have access to the survey, again, reach out to us and we'll be able to get them on our list and generate their own links for them. So the emails, though, will be sent from a Qualtrics account, which is a software that we use to administer the survey. So I encourage everyone, um, as you know, email security and privacy is becoming uh, more of an imperative issue. Um, some of our uh, access to kind of external email can be sensitive. So if you don't receive that email by the end of the day on Friday, just check your spam folders. If you have a more sophisticated IT protection system, you may need to um, include the email from which the Qualtrics uh, links will be sent from. So if that's the case, we can provide that email uh, address to you so that when your email receives it, everything will kind of go through. Uh, it's a generic Qualtrics email, uh, but I know sometimes uh, the system can be very protective in that regard. So um, if you fall under that category, just let us know. The survey is then open for 12 weeks, starting Friday, February 7th, 2020, and all the way up to a close of business on Friday, May 1st, 2020. So that's generally the timeline, about three months of data collection that we keep open. Obviously, there are um, some other factors that may uh, uh, require you to have an extension or a, uh, you know, you're providing a typical service that may be difficult to kind of manage the data on or just there are things that come up in your agency. Uh, definitely reach out to us as soon as possible if you have a sense that you know, maybe there's 12 weeks will not be sufficient for your submission. Uh, to, that happens every year to a degree, so we're happy to work with agencies who communicate that to us um, whenever they find that out. So continuing on with next steps in the submission process, uh, really to have a complete agency, re agency response, we do need uh, the submission for both of the survey components. And typically, that is the case, but I think depending on how you divvy up the survey in your agency, sometimes things might get lost and, you know, um, the, it may be hard to kind of bring those two components back together for your submission response. We're pretty good in our analysis of knowing kind of who, uh, who owes us what and what's outstanding, so we're good about reaching out, uh, but just recall that both pieces of the survey are required for a full submission. 
Now, one thing to consider um, for everyone on this webinar is really what is the optimal process for your agency submission? And that's something, um, and I learned in doing this project last year, is really with so many of our agencies, there really is so many different ways in which uh, an agency does complete their survey. So I wanted to highlight some of those options um, just so you have a sense um, so you can ask that internal question of what is the best way for us to, you know, prepare uh, our data for the submission. So in some cases, an agency might just have one respondent, um, whether that is, a, you know, a diocesan director, whether that is someone who's in charge of your research, PQI evaluation team, whether that is administrative personnel. Sometimes there is only just one person. Um, who collects all of the information and does both the core and the program detail, and they just handle it that way. Uh, sometimes uh, there's also a case where you might just have two respondents, one who covers all of the high-level agency information in the core, and perhaps there's another person, usually um, some kind of divisional or program director that might cover all of the different program detail sections. Um, so sometimes it's done that way as well. Most often than not, uh, surveys are made up of multiple respondents, and some, for some agencies, as many as 10, 13, 15 different people who have to submit data. And really, that is the most common way in which we receive full agency responses. Um, typically, one person is still responsible for the core, the high-level agency information, but then all of the different program de detail sections are completed by the respective you know, program director or uh, manager of that specific section. Um, so I just highlight all of those different ways of the submission processes to emphasize really that there's no right or wrong way to do the survey. Um, we are, um, you know, happy to assist you if there's um, kind of an internal challenge in what maybe be the best way to prepare that data and to really do it in a way that's efficient and timely and really just streamlined. As Ashley mentioned, we understand that there are a lot of moving parts and the survey takes a lot of time. So um, we want to make sure that uh, we can help you do it in a way that really fits your organizational capacity uh, to submit. All right, so continuing with that, submission tips. Uh, just like with the clinic portion of the survey, you can complete an unfinished submission at a later time. Since we're using uh, personal links this year, similar to last year, I think last year was the first time we decided to use that, all of the data that you enter in your survey form is going to be saved to that personal link. So for whatever reason, if you have to go collect more data, if it's just kind of getting lengthy, um, you know, all of that will be saved and you can revisit just using that same link that you were generated. One limitation that does exist is that there are certain sections, uh, namely in the program detail sections, um, where you're not able to just move back and forth between the blocks, just uh, a product of the way that the survey is built out and designed um, so that we can ensure, you know, you really only have to complete certain sections if you provide those services or programs. So I'll just say, you will find some places where maybe you're moving through the survey and then you say, oh, wait a minute, I made an error or I have to go back and add something, and you'll find that you're not able to do that. Um, that will be the case in some places, um, but there are uh, ways around to kind of uh, uh, to work around that. If you jump to that last bullet point, I should have put that before, um, but you're able to request a retake link if you need to go backwards to a lock section or if you just find any errors or, uh, yeah, errors in your submission. If you do, generate a retake link, all of the data that you enter will be stored. So you're not starting from scratch unless you're asking us to wipe your submission clean. That happens very rarely. Um, but all it does is kind of just take you back to the starting point um, and then all of your information will be saved. So we found that that's really a more efficient way to utilize those personal survey links so that all your data stays in one place. Back to that third point though, um, if you're a respondent, so if you fill out the survey using one of these personal uh, links, you will receive an email copy of your submission. So you'll receive a copy of that. Uh, but also there's a part in each of uh, the survey components where it is asking you to list a reviewer. And if uh, that'll be someone at your agency who essentially you're saying, um, you know, I trust this information to be correct and valid, but maybe my, uh, my um, 
you know, supervisor or my DB needs to look at all of the submissions that comes in before we really finalize the entirety of the survey. That happens often too. As long as everyone in your agency is um, identifying the same reviewer and that person will then receive email copies of all of the staff submissions. Um, and that's really a good exercise um, for an agency to just validate what they're entering and spot errors, um, especially if you have multiple people that are completing the survey. So then moving into the respondent resources, we've thought a lot about how to create materials that will help assist um, really in the, you navigating the survey. So uh, as a result uh, of this webinar, you will receive a follow-up email in 24 hours that contains all of the materials that we've uploaded here in the webinar portal. Uh, so that will include this recording. If you uh, someone missed it or if a colleague didn't get to register or if it was just super fun and you want to listen to it again, uh, you'll find the webinar recording and the presentation slides here today. We've also developed the user guide. So it's a pretty uh, robust summary, but still a bit high level of you know, the different components of the survey, all the different sections of the data, not necessarily item by item, but so you get a gist of the scope of the data that's being collected. If you are interested in item by item, then we do provide PDF copies of the survey instruments. So there are three that are attached in the webinar portal here, one for the core, one for the program detail, and one for clinic uh, legal immigration services section. A new tool that we have developed this year is called the Respondent Aggregation Tool. So we'll talk more about that in the next slide. Uh, this was really created to assist the agency respondents in preparing their submission data in advance. So we recognize your data lives all over the place, probably in different systems and forms and CRM systems. Um, and a lot of the times, uh, it's really important to just try to prepare everything offhand probably not as efficient to just open the survey and try to answer questions as you go. Uh, so we've just developed a spreadsheet that contains each of the sections to document and aggregate all of the survey data from your multiple staff or programs. So we give a shout out to the CCOSA m a section, the steering committee. Um, we met with them in person uh, early last month and they mentioned, you know, um, we really just end up using Excel sheets to have to aggregate all of the data across programs. Um, so we said, oh, well, in that case, then let's just take the instrument, put it in Excel form so that it can just assist you with that aggregation. So this is something lots of you folks have already been doing. I would say it's not meant to be a replacement for what internal process or procedure that you already have. Simply, it's a, a tool that's available if you, um, you know, need something that uh, more, maybe more structured and that already lists all of the survey or the survey content there. So it's completely optional, up to your use. Um, but if you do decide to use it, you must still complete the formal submission via Qualtrics. So we won't accept any of the Excel sheets with that raw data as formal submissions. They still need to be entered uh, formally through the Qualtrics platform. Um, so hopefully some of you do find this tool useful. We'll hear more feedback about, you know, how much value that provided um, at the end of the data collection period. So then moving forward, all of the resources I mentioned you will receive in a follow-up email tomorrow. Um, they are available for download here in the webinar portal, but you'll also be able to access them through the CCUSA members portal, and that's through the CCUSA website. Um, you will need to register for an account, and we highly suggest that each staff person has their own account. So there are some links there that will help you navigate to the website and the members portal so that you can create an account. If you have any issues um, accessing the account itself, uh, we uh, listed Lily Stewart's contact information. She is the digital communications manager here at CCUSA. Absolutely brilliant um, and very uh, very helpful in having people navigate some of the, the technical pieces of accessing that. Uh, but once you're in the members portal, there is a section that you'll see named annual survey resources. It's very hard to miss. So everything here uh, that we've included will live there as well. Um, and the resources that Ashley demonstrated, as well as some from the past years, those are also found there as well. So we always try to encourage folks to uh, use the members portal to access uh, the data, the materials, the resources, anything that we produce from the research and evaluation team, as well as, as the other teams at CCUSA, uh, it all lives there. So definitely take advantage of that. 
All right. So that's pretty much all of our contacts um, about the survey for 2019. I did want to include the, all of the contact information for the panelists on this webinar. As you'll see, there are two that are asterisks. So these are the folks. If you have technical assistance questions, or really questions related to anything about the survey, you want to reach out to them. For CCUSA, that'll be Ashley, uh, our research analyst. And then for clinic, of course, will be Sharon. I will say that email is always the best way to kind of ask your questions first. Um, but if it's something that requires a phone follow-up, we're definitely open to do so. And that includes myself, even though I don't have the asterisk. But any questions at all, we want to provide all the technical assistance and support that you need. Um, but just give us a heads up over email, and then everything we can troubleshoot or work out kind of as we go. So just want to thank everybody for participating. We had a very high number of webinar registrants, over 300, um, which is really exciting to know that people um, are you know, motivated to participate in this project. We're going to open it up for a couple minutes um, of Q&A. So we're looking here to see what we received from our folks on the webinar. So one that we have, and Sharon, I believe you're still with us, is that correct? We have one particular to clinics. Um, yes, I'm here. I'm here. Yes, correct me if this is true. So someone asked, uh, do the clinic, does the clinic survey questions apply for all immigration programs, immigration legal programs, or just those that have a direct clinic affiliation? Um, do you want to go ahead and take that over? I believe I know the answer, but I, um, maybe we'll defer to you. Yeah. Yes, we're sending out um, the, link the link to the survey via this system for our CCUSA uh, affiliates, the ones that have both affiliations. And then everyone else, which we have another couple hundred uh, affiliates, will get an email next Monday to uh, come into the survey. So it, it's not for all legal immigration programs, but only the ones that are affiliated with clinic. Thanks, Sharon. Um, so another question, can the 2018 response be pre-populated into 2019 survey? So at this time, this iteration of the survey does not allow for that. Um, that's an idea that we've heard about and we've explored, um, but for you know challenges related to kind of data integrity, um, we want to kind of keep exploring that. So as for now, no, your, pop, your responses from 2018 are not pre-populated. I believe clinic has some capacity on their end to do that for their section, but not for the CCA sec section at large. Um, if you are a new contact to the survey, or if you just like to use um, last year's submission for reference, we have developed reports from all of last year's survey submissions that we sent out to agencies as they were completed. So we have that in raw data that we're happy to share with you. We also have them in like a report style form that's a little more readable if you're interested in that. Um, so that's your data. So if that's something that you uh, would like access to, not just for you know the survey, but if you just want access to that in general, please reach out to us and we are able to uh, provide that uh, as you ask. So that's a really good question. And we don't pre-populate at this time on the clinic. Uh, but I can also send you, upon your request to my email, your last year's responses in a PDF file. Right. Thank you. Uh, another question we received here. Can the survey be printed in advance to assist with the collection of data prior to inputting directly online? Yes, absolutely. So as I mentioned, uh, we included all PDF versions of the instruments. They're all attached here in the webinar portal. Then you will receive a follow-up email that also has PDF versions of the instruments. Um, and that also includes the, that respondent aggregation tool that I mentioned. So that's essentially taking the uh, instruments in Excel form that uh, if you need help in aggregating that data, um, if that's useful to you, you'll have access to that. So yes, we most of us encourage, um, we can't imagine a, a case uh, when you're just kind of opening the survey and able to directly input it. And so we encourage you in whatever way is feasible for you to prepare your data in advance. We've made the instruments available. Um, definitely encourage you to do so. All right, let's see. Uh, another question that we have is, can the survey sections be submitted at the same time or inversely, can sections be completed at different times? Um, 
So both are true, depending on how many respondents you have. I think this particularly pertains to the program detail section that's covering all the different service areas. So in some cases, um, you, your agency might be completing all of those sections and they'll all be different people. And that's okay. They can be completed at different times as long as they're being accessed or completed through uh, each individual person's survey link. So you could do it that way. Or there might be a case if all of your program details or some of your program detail sections are being completed by a single person, you can select as many as you're um, responding to and you can submit them all at once. So the survey, to answer your question, yes, is, it's designed with the flexibility to either do them all at once, do them separately, or do them and come back to them and edit them. Anything that you might need to do to modify your response, uh, you'll be able to do that. Okay, somebody asked, so I can't move forward if I leave questions blank. That's a really great question. Some questions you can. We don't, um, we don't force response every single item, but we do uh, embed content validation as well as some restrictions so that you really can't advance to the next page unless you're answering the question. Um, so those, as I mentioned, they're not for all of the items. Um, you know, we designed it so that if you're just kind of inputting letters where there should be numbers or vice versa, then it, the survey will be able to de detect that. Um, so we, we did that with some limited, um, kind of to a limited extent. So uh, that's why we provide the PDF versions of the instrument so that if you're interested in knowing what data you need access to, you have that all there. How are we on time? A couple more minutes. So, Let's see, someone asked if they missed the due date for the survey submission. Um, thank you for being so excited to get started, but no, the survey will open on Friday and then you'll have all the way till May 1st. So you have plenty of time uh, to get a head start. I wish we could uh, offer some prizes or some incentives for folks who uh, complete early or kind of complete consistently. We, did, we actually did do an analysis of the last uh, five years of survey, survey data based on the responses in terms of which agencies are pretty consistent, and which are, you know, for whatever reason, um, may have been consistent at one time and no longer. So we've done some analyses around that and um, kind of knowing what, who really participates um, year to year. And um, I've had some ideas about, you know, offering some, um, just some thank you um, kind of accolades around that. So we're going to keep exploring that idea. Uh, but no, you did not miss the, the survey date yet. Okay, and I think this will be the last question that we take. Uh, someone's asking, how, how do you retrieve your survey passcode? So um, again, the survey is going to be um, accessible through the personal survey link, which you'll receive via email. So you don't, they're not password protected. Um, they're made just for you. So as long as you can receive those emails, you'll click the link in the email and then you'll be on your way to go to the survey. Um, if you are perhaps referring to the members portal passcode, um, you can go back to the slide that uh, explains kind of where you can find the members portal links. It's really just from the CCUSA website main page and you'll toggle up to the top right corner that reads for member agencies and you'll be able to uh, create an account there if you don't have one or if you forgot your password, which I always do, um, you could reset that there. Again, Lily Stewart's uh, contact information is in the slides and she will be able to help you with any of that account access as long as you uh, reach her by email. Um, that's probably the most efficient way to do so. Okie dokie. Well, thank you everybody for participating. Lots of really great questions. I know there were some more that we got, um, as some are a little more uh, involved, so we'll try to reach out to you via email um, and, and chat with you. But when I say don't hesitate to reach out, we truly mean that. Um, certainly Ashley and I are uh, available very often uh, via email, probably because we're both millennials. So it worked out pretty well for us if you if you just give us a shout out or let us know how your survey process is going. Um, but we're really excited to see what data we collect and what story we can tell for 2019. So I want to thank everyone and have a great rest of your week. Thank you all.